Good evening. Very good to be with you one more time during this season of Lent as we conclude our, our walk through the, the steps of the cross, hearing about our Savior's passion, marveling at his love for us as we do so. Uh, we'll conclude again our series that we've had throughout these Wednesdays of messages that we're calling God on Trial. And tonight we look at sympathy as we hear the conversation between Jesus and some of the women of Jerusalem, his words to them, on his way out to Calvary's cross. So may God bless us as we sing praise and consider his word this evening. Our first song is called Delay Not, Delay Not, number 712 in your hymnal, or the words are on your display board. Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God our Father and from his Son, the crucified one, our Savior whom we worship now and always, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Word of God we'll consider tonight is words that we did read just a moment ago. They were at the start of the Passion reading, the words that Jesus spoke to the women of Jerusalem who were weeping for him on his way to the cross. As we sit here tonight, the estimate is that about two out of every three Americans claims some kind of affiliation or connection with Christianity. That's approximately the, the figure. Ten or twelve years ago, that number was closer to three and four, or about 75%. And the people who study and predict such things tell us that in another generation or so, perhaps, that number is likely to be around the 50% mark, and at that point, Christianity will, for the first time in our country's history, be a minority religion. Among the youngest generations of Americans, it seems as though that may already be the case. So how should we feel about this? Sit around saying, poor us, woe is us. Feel sorry for ourselves at all of the real and imagined challenges that are going to come our way when Christianity no longer has that solid majority of Americans, at least on paper. Plenty of stories out there already about changes that are taking place. You've heard so many of them. People who have lost their job because they refuse to kowtow with the world's ideology in one way or another. School shooters who intentionally target Christians. There's plenty of other stories out there. You may have stories of your own about this sort of thing. But again, how, how should we feel about all of this? Wallow in self-pity? Is that what God would have us do or feel? If there was ever anyone who seemed like they would deserve plenty of sympathy, it seems like it would have been Jesus on his way out to the cross. And yet, as you heard in his words that we read earlier, when Jesus saw people mourning and wailing for him, he specifically rejected their sympathy. He told them, do not weep for me, weep for yourselves. And so on this night where we ponder the, the story of Christ's crucifixion, if there's sympathy to be had in that story, we want to ask ourselves the question, just where should our sympathy be directed? It's not too surprising, I suppose, that the women of Jerusalem felt sorry for Jesus. By this point, he must have been a difficult sight to behold, the blood streaming down his cheeks from the crown of thorns, pounded onto his head, his face also probably bruised and blackened from all the slaps and punches and blows he'd been receiving all the way back to when he was 
first arrested in Gethsemane. And his back, probably full of lacerations, and, and that word probably is quite the understatement, the brutal result of the flogging of Roman soldiers. So weakened was Jesus, and of course, humanly speaking, I mean, according to his human nature, was he that Jesus, a man in the prime of his earthly life, was apparently unable to finish the task of carrying his cross because, as you also heard in the Passion reading, the soldiers were forced to conscript a man named Simon of Cyrene to carry the cross, and that's almost certainly because Jesus was no longer able to carry that beam of wood the rest of the distance. And so again, it's not surprising that the, the women who saw this were, were appalled. Maybe some of those who were weeping and mourning were even some of Jesus' followers because we also heard that many people had come down from Galilee, some of whose names you read earlier. But Jesus just calls them daughters of Jerusalem, and, and so for the most part, these were probably not his, his followers, these were just People from the city, right, who, who had heard about these events and the commotion and, and went along with the crowd to see what was going on. And, and when they saw Jesus, they were horrified at the sight of how brutally human beings can treat each other. But again, Jesus told them that their sympathy for him was misdirected. Daughters of Jerusalem, he said, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children, for the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. The time will come, Jesus said, and that time was not all that many years in the future, about 40 years after the events of the crucifixion, the time when the, the Jews who had hated Roman rule rose up in revolt to try to get rid of their Roman occupation, and the Romans responded by sending in their legions to crush the rebellion, to destroy the city of Jerusalem, a war that was filled with horrors and atrocities. So bad it would be, Jesus predicted, that the women with families would be jealous of those people who had none. Because the suffering would be so great that it would be better to only have to deal with your own personal suffering rather than the awful emotional trauma of seeing the people that you cared about the most being treated in such horrible ways or dying and feel powerless to do anything to help them. History records that Jesus' prediction about Jerusalem was completely fulfilled. But those words that Jesus used at the end, that then they will say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills cover us, those words should make our ears prick up a little. Because this is not the only place where those phrases are found in the Bible. They're found in the Old Testament and they're also found elsewhere in the New Testament. In particular, they're found in the book of Revelation, chapter 6 where John is being given visions of the end of the world. And John is shown how at that time when the very heavenly bodies will be shaken from their places and it's obvious that the world is coming to an end, John was told that at that point all of the people of the world, from the greatest to the least, from the kings all the way down to the slaves, would flee in terror and then they would cry out with those words to the mountains fall on us and to the hills cover us because they would declare the great day of the wrath of the Lamb has come and who can withstand it? And Jesus, as he speaks those words, was surely looking ahead to that day too. So in other words, the real sympathy when we see Jesus suffering and death, does not need to be for Jesus. 
Certainly not for us, anyway, that because we know Jesus is no longer suffering. He has ascended and is seated at the right hand of God. He completed his work perfectly, triumphant over all of that pain and suffering, and even over death in the grave. No, Jesus says the real sympathy ought to be directed toward sinners who are about to face the wrath of God. That seems to be the same thing Jesus meant with that last little phrase that he added when he said to the women, if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? In other words, if if this is what God allows to happen to his own son, the holy and righteous one, what will happen to those who hated the Lord and rejected his son? We know that we deserve that suffering and punishment from God as much as anyone because of our sins. But this is why Jesus came. This is why he suffered so much, to spare us from that dreadful prospect. You heard the words that he prayed right as they were nailing him to the cross. Father, forgive them. He cried out, for they do not know what they are doing. And in those words of Jesus, we see his urgent desire for us and for all sinners. His prayer for us that we would be saved. We see the reason for his willingness to go through with it all so that he might prevent our suffering and we might have forgiveness for our sins. A love that transcends understanding which has earned for us a peace that also transcends understanding. But what about those who don't know him? What about those who, like most of the people of Jerusalem, like most of those women to whom Jesus was speaking, don't believe in Jesus as their Savior but have rejected him? What about those who will face not the the wrath of an invading Roman army, but those who will face the wrath of a holy God? This is where our sympathies really ought to lie. And I think they do. If our hearts ache and bleed for those who, who lose a loved one to death, but one who has died in the Lord... Don't our hearts ache even more in a way for those who have a loved one who has rejected the Lord altogether? If we feel that intense sympathy for someone who has been parted from a dear one by death, even though they know and have that confident faith that that parting on earth is not forever, that one day by the grace and power of God there will be a joyful reunion in glory that has no end. And yet, if we feel sorry for people in that situation, don't we and shouldn't we feel even more sympathy for those who have no hope, those who have no thought of a heavenly reunion and no faith in anyone to bring them there? Jesus reminds us with these words to feel sorry for those who don't know him. In other words, Jesus doesn't want us to hate those who don't know him. Jesus doesn't want us to mock those who don't know him. Jesus doesn't want us to be terrified of those who don't know him. He wants us to feel sympathy for those who don't know him. But of course, that sympathy for us is is not to be just a feeling. This is the kind of sympathy that leads us to, to prayer, that leads us to work, that leads us to witness, that leads us to do whatever it is that we can do so that more sinners are brought to faith in Jesus or brought back to faith in Jesus through repentance. Now, when we say that Jesus doesn't want us to sit around feeling sorry for ourselves and full of self-pity. That doesn't mean that we don't want Jesus to feel sorry for us and have pity for us. It's not true at all. Lord, have mercy, 
Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. That's the ancient cry of the church of every age. Of course we need Jesus to have mercy on us to come and help us in all of our many difficulties, to give us strength to fight temptation, strength to serve, and and strength to forgive, to help us with the healing of our bodies when no one else can help us, and most of all, to give us forgiveness for our many sins. Well, we absolutely need Jesus' mercy, and we know that we have it because, as we often say in those beautiful words, His mercy endures forever. But our own pity, our own sympathy, does not need to be for ourselves. How can we have a woe-is-me attitude when we know that we are saints who will inherit eternal life? How can we possibly sit around wallowing in self-pity when we have the awesome status, dearly loved child of God and heir of eternal life? And as I said before, our sympathy certainly doesn't need to be for Jesus. That's not why we celebrate these midweek Lenten services and and hear all about the sufferings of Jesus. It's, It's not so that we can feel sorry for him. It's so that we can be all the more amazed at the depths of his love and worship him for it. No, our sympathy should properly be directed toward others. And certainly it's not wrong for us to feel sympathy for one another who know the Lord when we're going through hardships and hard times to have our hearts ache for each other and and do whatever it is that we can to help and encourage and lift each other up. That's an awesome and wonderful thing. But Jesus' words tonight remind us that maybe our greatest sympathy should be for those who have the greatest need of all. The need to know they have a Savior. The need for a peace with God and, and a hope of heaven and whom we know will have none of those things unless they receive them through Jesus Christ. But again, that sympathy for us is not just a feeling, but a desire to help however it is we can help those who have that greatest need. Jesus, in his darkest hour, prayed for forgiveness for sinners. That was his greatest prayer, that they would be saved. May that be in the same way our greatest passion, our deepest sympathy, our most urgent desire and prayer that more and more people would come to know and worship the one who suffered so much so that they and we might be spared. Amen.